I find these crazy looking sharks adorable. Their name, Wobbegongs, come from an old Australian Aboriginal word meaning beard. And it does indeed look as though they have a beard, especially the tasseled Wobbegong, which has branching skin flaps running continuously from its pectoral fins around the front of its head. Wobbegongs also possess barbels that surround their nose, eyes and mouth, adding to the effect. The barbels also work as lures to catch prey, sometimes moving, imitating the movement of a fish. Their bearded appearance and beautiful coloration is great for camouflage and gave them the common name carpet sharks, as many of the species look like ornately patterned carpets, especially as they are bottom dwelling sharks and spend most of their time resting on the sea floor. There are 12 species of Wobbegon and belong to the order Erectolobiformes which is comprised of seven different families and include the whale shark and nurse sharks. Wobbegongs belong to the family Erectolobidae, which means stretched out lobe. The wobbegongs, like other carpet sharks, have two dorsal fins and a relatively short transverse mouth that does not extend behind the ears. There are grooves called nasoral grooves, which connect the nostrils to the mouth. They have five gill slits, with the fourth one overlapping the fifth which are situated just in front of the origin of the pectoral fin. They also have a spiracle situated just behind the eyes. Being bottom dwelling sharks, wobbegongs ventilate using buccal ventilation, where they lower the floor of their mouths to draw oxygenated water into their mouth and then raise the floor to push the oxygen rich water over the gills. The spiracle provides oxygenated blood directly to the eye and brain through a separate blood vessel and is very useful if buried under sediments. Most species of wobbegong reach a maximum length of 1.25 meters. The two largest species, the spotted wobbegong and the banded wobbegong, reach about three meters in length. They are found in the Western Pacific Ocean and Eastern Indian Ocean, particularly around Australia and Indonesia. The Japanese wobbegong occurs as far north as Japan. They live in warm shallow waters on coral or rocky reefs, under piers and on sandy bottoms. They have even been found in very shallow water that only just covers them. They are ambush predators, that is, they sit and wait for their food to come to them. They can use their barbels and fleshy lobes to attract their prey or even wave their tail to attract other fish. They are very flexible and can bend back towards their tail to bite anything at that end of their body. Spotted wobbegong have also been observed sneaking up on prey from a distance. They mainly eat bottom dwelling fish and invertebrates such as octopus, crab and lobster. As they don't move around too much, they only need to eat about twice a week. Wobbegongs have powerful jaws and can open their mouths very wide to be able to swallow prey that is almost as big as they are. They swallow their prey whole or, if it is too large, they hold on to it until it dies and then eat a chunk at a time. They have even been seen eating other sharks. Divers have photographed a tasseled wobbegong eating a white bamboo shark. They have small, sharp, needle-like teeth. The most detail I could find was specifically about tasseled wobbegong teeth, of which there are 23 to 26 upper teeth and 19 lower teeth. Each tooth has a single slender, pointed cusp. Three of the upper central teeth and two of the lower ones are especially long and fan-like. From the limited pictures I could find, it looks as though this is a characteristic of most of the species of wobbegongs. When provoked, they have been known to bite humans. Reported incidents include people accidentally standing on them in shallow water and divers and snorkelers touching one or blocking their escape route. Remember how flexible they are? Well, you don't even want to touch their tail. Their bite can penetrate wetsuits, and once they have bitten, they are known to hang on. Although not life-threatening, it is a painful bite, so don't go touching any, and be careful where you tread. Although they don't like to move very much, they have been seen to move across the seabed using their bottom fins, which makes them look just like they are walking. They have even been observed walking from one tide pool to another. As long as their gills are wet, they can survive a short period of time out of the water. The eyes of wobbegongs are located on the top of their heads and raised above the plane of their body. This gives them a good view of any approaching prey. 
Scientists have studied the visual adaptations of four species of wobbegong sharks, the western wobbegong, the dwarf spotted wobbegong, the ornate wobbegong and the spotted wobbegong. They found that the eyesight of the western and ornate wobbegongs was suited to both day and night activities, whereas the spotted and dwarf spotted wobbegongs were better adapted to low light levels. They concluded that the western and ornate wobbegongs were visually suited to a range of light conditions, whereas the spotted and dwarf spotted wobbegongs are probably more active in low light conditions such as nighttime or in the early morning or late afternoon. Research on spotted wobbegongs has shown that they have large clusters of electrosensory pores both dorsally and ventrally that aid their benthic lifestyle and ambush hunting style. These features were also found in angel sharks, another shark that likes to chill on the seabed and ambush its predators, and are unlike other shark species. I am guessing, but it seems reasonable to predict that since all species of wobbegong are benthic dwellers and ambush predators, they will all have this sensory adaptation. Males are attracted to females when they release pheromones into the water. The males will bite the females and insert one of his claspers into her cloaca. Females give birth after a gestation period of 10 to 11 months. They are ovoviviparous, which means that the young develop in eggs nourished by the egg yolk inside the mother's body. They hatch inside her and continue to develop for a period of time and then the mother gives birth to the live young. The litter size varies with species, from just a few to as many as 53. There is no parental care, but the young pups will hang out with each other for protection. It is reported that spotted wobbegong will eat the unfertilized eggs whilst continuing to develop in the uterus, in a process called oophagy. People do keep wobbegong sharks as pets. The best ones to keep are the smaller sized tasseled wobbegong and ward's wobbegong and as they only feed twice a week, they are fairly low maintenance. Being lethargic sharks, they don't need much area to roam, making them ideal pets. A drawback of keeping them as pets is that they will eat their tank mates, even quite big ones, and as we know, they don't appreciate being touched. Wobbegongs are predated upon by large fish or marine mammals. Although being quite feisty, the predator needs to be very careful. The main threat to them comes, of course, from people. The spotted wobbegong are known to be caught by trawl netting and trammel nets, which are similar to a gill net, but are made up of three layers of netting. They also get inside lobster nets and pots, and are thought of as pests in the lobster trade, as they eat both the lobster and the bait. Wobbegongs are sometimes eaten, apparently their meat tastes nice, and they are sometimes on the menu of Australian fish and chip shops. Their lovely patterned skin is sometimes used to make leather, but they are not often hunted by man, possibly because their dorsal fins are not very big, so they are not much good for making shark fin soup. If you go onto the IUCN website and look for the conservation status of Wobbegong, you will find that most of the species are listed as least concern. This means that the species is not being a focus of species conservation because the specific species is still plentiful in the wild. However, the Indonesian wobbegong is listed as near threatened, which means that they do not qualify for critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable now, but is close to qualifying for, or is likely to qualify for, a threatened category in the near future. Whilst researching this video, I have been struck by how little is really known about the wobbegong, including their populations. It would seem that a lot more research needs to be completed on these crazy looking sharks to gain a better understanding of their life cycle to enable us to protect them for future generations. If you have enjoyed this video, then please like, subscribe and share with your like-minded friends.